In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, the Acts of the Apostles and the Synoptic Gospels tell us that 40 days after Easter, Jesus was taken up from the church on earth to be seated with God the Father in heaven. And so that 40th day always falls on a Thursday, Ascension Thursday, it is called in the church calendar. And um, yes, down at Grace Church Cathedral on Thursday, they had a lovely service and some of us were able to go. But for many of the rest of us for whom Thursday isn't an option, and after all, church is more fun when people can come, (laughs) we continue to celebrate that wonderful event in the life of the church on the Sunday which follows. And so here we are today, the seventh Sunday of Easter, but also remembering the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, some of you may remember that a year ago at this time, I told you of an experience I had on the campus of the University of South Carolina. There is an Anglican chapel there, not affiliated with the Episcopal Church, let me be quick to say. And I was a visitor there once. You may remember that this is the house of studies where there is a full-size mechanical Elvis in the restroom. Remember that? He is motion and sound sensitive. (laughs) So that if one were to say euphemistically, wash one's hands, the sound of that activity would cause Elvis to sing, I'm all shook up, you know, full mechanical (laughs) action. Had I died of a heart attack during that moment, I would have expected Fiona to sue the priest there for wrongful death. Going out from this little restroom alcove there into what has been made into a chapel, a chapel which I described as a combination of holy place and peewee's playhouse. The chapel is uh, dedicated to the ascension. And over the altar are a pair of feet showing that Jesus has ascended into heaven. It's really bad art. looking like uh, someone had taken Ronald McDonald and shoved him through the ceiling. (laughs) And worse theology. Because it gives the impression that the only thing the ascension is really about is that we still live in sort of a flat earth on which Jesus, like a rocket was strapped to him, you know, went up into heaven away from the church. And, And people just have that image and don't think any more about it. Bad art is something that we don't have to study to know things about, right? We can see bad clip art in a church bulletin and know that it's bad, even if we haven't studied. And good art is something that we know intuitively as well. Some of the earliest iconography of the ascension show Jesus being ascended into heaven, and indeed what we see are his lower extremities, but not for the purpose of talking about Jesus being up and us being down, but for the purpose of saying who Jesus is. In ancient mythologies and cosmologies, those who ascended into the clouds were emperors and great men. And in Jesus, we see his lower extremities, not just to look at his lovely feet, but to see the mark of the nails in them. That the one who was taken up into heaven on our account was the one who was wounded on our behalf. And so the ascension in the way that we can understand it is the completion of the whole work of the incarnation. This Jesus who was made present to us in the world on the 25th of March, as we commemorate it every year, when the Blessed Virgin Mary said to the angel Gabriel, Be it unto me according to thy word, and he was conceived in her womb, through the day of the ascension. Because when Jesus ascended to the Father, theologically speaking, we are saying that he did not abandon his humanity. He did not abandon our humanity. And therefore, that chasm that has separated us from God has in that moment, in that brief life event that we know as Jesus of Nazareth, that chasm has been bridged. And we are a new creation because of it. 
One theologian that I read this week said that it would be analogous to a radical evolutionary leap. Let me explain that a bit. We know that um, evolutionary biology is something that happens over millennia, right? And the little changes that happen within species are so tiny that it would take, well, many, many, many lifetimes to be able to discern it. But what would happen if those small changes were sped up so that we could see the entire progress, both in terms of biology and in terms of technology? For the Neanderthal, for whom a sharpened rock was a great marvel, Imagine what that Neanderthal would have been able to think had he been able to see Abbot Suger's grand accomplishment in Gothic architecture at Saint-Denis in Paris. Imagine what Abbot Suger would have thought if he could have seen Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. So if we can imagine such a technological and biological leap Imagine that being the same thing in, in terms of theology. That's what we say is true about the ascension. That, that great chasm has been bridged by this one event in a short lifetime. Jesus of Nazareth came into our world, suffered our suffering, sweated our sweat, cried our tears, felt our temptations, died our death, rose in anticipation of our everlasting life, and now our humanity, by extension, is with him, with God, in heaven. It's an amazing thing to think about. That's what the ascension is about theologically, but how's that making you feel right now? You're feeling all energized by hearing the esoteric aspects of this, ready to go out into the world changed and energized. So much of theology is like that if we just leave it in the realm of the theoretical and don't flesh it out. And so I'd like to share with you this morning some fleshing out of that idea that in the in-between times, the ascension in our eventual seeing God face to face, that things are still happening even though we cannot see them, touch them, know them. In her last book, as we now know sadly, her final book, in the epilogue of that very last book, Rachel Held Evans, whose funeral was live streamed yesterday and several of us were able to watch it, wrote of her sister-in-law, who was um, gifted in a way to bring out conversation even from the reticent. And as she listened with an incredible skill for listening, she would prompt the storyteller to tell more uh, with a sort of uh, vocal tick of hers. And then, and the story would go a little further, and then, and the story would go a little further, and then, and before you know it, even the shy among us had opened up, people were laughing, and the story had been fleshed out in a way uh, that one couldn't have imagined. So using that as a context, Rachel says this in her epilogue of her last book. Christians believe we live in the and then after Jesus' resurrection and before his return. We live inside an unfinished story, a story that began with the Spirit of God hovering over the, hovering over the primordial waters at the beginning of time, and which took a dramatic, climatic turn 2,000 years ago, when the same God became human, lived among us, and beat death once and for all. We share this story with Mary Magdalene and the Apostle Paul. We share it with St. Augustine and Julian of Norwich, Desmond Tutu, we share it with the pastor who runs the soup kitchen out of the church basement and with the first guy in line to eat there each week. The stories we tell with our lives then aren't meaningless absurdities, tragic in their brevity, but rather subplots of a grander narrative, every moment charged with significance as we contribute our own riffs, soliloquies, and plot twists to the larger epic. The Holy Spirit coaxing us along with an ever ebullient, and then, and then, and then. 
And then quoting the Anglican bishop and theologian N.T. Wright, she goes on to say, quoting Bishop Wright, What you do in the Lord is not in vain. You are not oiling the wheels of a machine that's about to roll over a cliff. You're not restoring a great painting that's shortly going to be thrown on the fire. You're not planting roses in a garden that's about to be dug up for a building site. You are, strange though it may seem, almost as hard to believe as resurrection itself, accomplishing something that will become in due course a part of God's new world. Every act of love, gratitude, and kindness, every work of art or music inspired by the love of God and delight in the beauty of his creation, every minute spent teaching a severely handicapped child to read or to walk, every act of care and nurture, of comfort and support for one's fellow human beings, and for that matter, for one's fellow non-human creatures, and of course, every prayer, all spirit-led teaching, every deed that spreads the gospel, builds up the church, embraces and embodies holiness rather than corruption, and makes the name of Jesus honored in the world. All of this will find its way through the resurrecting power of God into the new creation that God will one day make. And then Rachel concludes with these few sentences. Imagine if you believe this. Imagine if every day you behaved as though it were true. The task of theology is the linking of our individual story to the biggest story we can imagine. If the biggest story we can imagine is about God's loving and redemptive work in the world, then our lives will be shaped by that epic. If the biggest story we can imagine is something else, like religious nationalism, or follow your bliss, or he who dies with the most toys wins, then our lives will be shaped by those narratives as well. For 40 days, we've been hearing the old, old story of the redemptive love of God who became flesh to dwell among us. For our whole lives we've been hearing this story over and over and over, Advent through Ascension and all of the wonderful stories and parables through the summer season that come. And to each of these stories that we've been given, that we've received, we are encouraged to add our own stories, (laughs) to know that our lives, whether we live for 37 years or 97 years, are not in vain, and that a loving attentive God hangs on every word goading us on and then and then and then in the name of God who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit